Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to start in the next one to two minutes. Over 200 people have registered for this particular webinar. So everyone except uh, us are on mute right now. Uh, we will explain in a moment how you can ask questions and raise other points. Um, but just be aware that for the first 45 minutes or so, and possibly the whole webinar, you'll be in listen-only mode. So we'll start in one to two minutes. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to get started now. Good afternoon, everyone. Today we're going to have a webinar on the new European Medical Devices Regulation, uh, Regulation 2017-745. We've entitled this particular webinar an overview for business. So the intended audience of today's webinar is non-regulatory people, particularly in business functions, so that they can understand from their non-regulatory perspective what this regulation is and what it is they have to do. My name is Oliver Bizatza. I'm MedTech Europe's Director for Regulations and Industrial Policy. I'm here in our offices with most of the regulatory team, uh, and we're going to have a, a large number of people on the line today, over 200 of you registered, which is fantastic to see. Because of the large number of people who registered, you're all on mute. Uh, that's for basically to keep the audio quality good. We're going to talk for about half of the time, and then we're going to open it up for questions. Um, what we'd like you to do uh, is to think about your questions and ask them as they occur to you during the conference. What you can do, if you see the chat function in Arcadon, you can ask your question through the chat function. Uh, if you don't see that function, or if it's grayed out, for instance, here on the final slide, we have a uh, a regulatory email address, regulatory at medtecheurope.org. You can send your questions to this email address, and people here in the room with me are going to collect the questions, and we'll try and answer as many of these as we can after the slideshow presentation is done. But let's first of all go through the webinar, and we look forward to a good Q&A afterwards. So getting started now with slide two. On the 5th of May 2017, the new European Union Medical Devices Regulation, or EU MDR, was published. Over the next three years, this new single piece of European legislation will replace the older rules found in the EU's two medical devices directives, which were published in the 1990s. The MDR significantly modifies and intensifies the compliance burden for this industry. While the main features of the older directives will remain, the level of evidence and documentation required from companies will increase under the MDR. In particular, companies should understand that the administrative and technical burden on manufacturers 
is expected to increase quite significantly. And so companies that wish to comply with these new rules are going to need to undertake long-term budgeting and in-depth project management. And this is an exercise which is going to directly impact not just the regulatory affairs function and the quality assurance function, it's also going to affect other functions across the company, such as clinical affairs, such as research and development, legal, marketing, manufacturing, supply chain, and especially senior management. So this high-level presentation and webinar from today is really targeted towards senior management so that they understand the essentials of the MDR for them and for other non-regulatory functions. And MedTech Europe's education and training offering is going to contain other sessions more targeted to regulatory audiences. If we start to look at the regulation in more detail, the first topic is the geographical scope. Like the previous directives uh, which are being replaced, the new MDR is going to continue to apply across all European Union member states. And it is also expected to continue applying across the European economic area markets, plus Switzerland and Turkey. And today, in 2017, that's a total of 33 different countries where these rules will apply. A key feature of the new regulation is continued use of CE marking, or the CE marking passport principle. This principle is maintained under the new regulation, meaning that lower risk devices can be self-certified by the manufacturer. But for higher risk devices, we have oversight by notified bodies, which are third-party certification bodies. For CE marking purposes, manufacturers can continue to use harmonized standards as a key but voluntary compliance mechanism. And while EU regulation of medical devices remains based on CE marking under the MDR, the new regime is expected to be enforced and overseen more stringently and consistently than the previous directives. Reprocessing of single-use devices is in principle banned under the MDR, unless national laws permit the activity. Where the activity is permitted at national level, the MDR obligations of manufacturers will apply to the reprocessors. And the new legislation also regulates health institutions like hospitals and clinics that reprocess single-use devices, whether they do so in-house or through third-party reprocessors. Overall, and despite these rules, however, the reprocessing of single-use devices is an activity that will be regulated largely at national rather than EU level. And finally, Proposals to ban certain hazardous substances were not ultimately incorporated into the new MDR. Nevertheless, if certain devices contain hazardous substances above the specified threshold, this must be justified and labeled. This obligation makes it imperative for companies to know, whether from suppliers, testing, or some other solution, which chemical substances are present in their devices. Now, on the right hand of the slide, some key changes. The most obvious change in the EU MDR is the increased requirements for the safety and performance of devices to be documented. It is essential to understand that no grandfathering is foreseen under the MDR. So all devices destined for future EU sales will need to comply with the new rules. This means that both new and legacy products need to be assessed case by case for their MDR readiness. A product that meets the old requirements may still need various forms of remediation in order to become compliant with the new rules. And the compliance must, again, be thoroughly documented. Moreover, there is more granular secondary legislation still to follow in the coming months and years. The secondary legislation will flesh out the MDR's documentation requirements further and will require companies to monitor and adapt their compliance activities 
as, as implementation of the MDR evolves. In addition, manufacturers' pre-market clinical evidence obligations are set to increase quite significantly. The opportunity to CE mark devices according to the so-called equivalence or literature review route is reduced. This combined with an explicit requirement for many high-risk devices to undergo pre-market clinical investigations means there is an overall expectation to generate fresh pre-market clinical data. The work needed to meet this expectation could certainly delay CE marking in some cases and add to costs especially for those devices and manufacturers who have relied heavily on the equivalence route in the past. And there are also strengthened obligations for manufacturers to collect post-market clinical follow-up data according to planned post-market activities. Transparency is another significant theme in the MDR. Final reports of clinical investigations plus summaries of those reports Will be, publicly will be publicly accessible in UDIMED, the new EU medical devices database. Commercially sensitive and proprietary information might therefore be in the public domain via UDIMED, unless the need to keep the information confidential has been duly justified. UDIMED will also give the public access to information regarding devices on the market information on those devices' manufacturing and distribution chains, as well as the vigilance status of products. This may increase overall product liability exposure across the entire supply chain. Regarding supply chain regulation, driven in part by the PIP breast implant scandal, the new EU MDR mandates visibility and traceability of the distribution chain both in terms of products and with respect to supply chain entities like importers, distributors, and authorized representatives. Many of these entities, called economic operators in the text, are explicitly regulated for the first time. And many of them acquire their own direct safety monitoring and reporting obligations on top of the obligations of the manufacturer. Although these economic operators are distinct legal entities, it is important to bear in mind that a legal entity can, for instance, be both an importer and a distributor at the same time. And these legal entities can exist both as third parties to the manufacturer and as in-house legal entities within the same corporation. So, to prepare for the new EU MDR, companies must clearly map out their various in-house and third-party economic operators to establish which legal entities are, established, are subject to which MDR requirements. And of the many economic operator obligations, the rules for authorized representatives in particular have significantly increased. Authorized representatives now play a pivotal role to ensure that the manufacturer complies as intended. Under the MDR, an authorized representative will face joint and several liability for injuries caused by defective products, even if the manufacturer breaching its own obligations was the cause of the industries. And this is on top of existing product liability legislation um, that might apply to these companies. Post-market obligations, such as post-market surveillance and safety reporting obligations, are also important. Under the MDR, manufacturers are subject to increased post-market surveillance and more uh, reporting requirements. Submission of adverse event reports, for instance, will become centralized in the future via the Udemed Vigilance Portal, which will constitute some changes but should bring some new efficiencies to the reporting system. The MDR also has a broadened product scope, meaning that it catches new, previously unregulated kinds of products. Going forward, non-medical or aesthetic products will be regulated under the MDR as non-medical purpose devices. For instance, cosmetic contact lenses, cosmetic fillers, and non-medical implants are all um, good examples of this. 
Devices offered to users in the EU via the internet are also in scope, as are devices used to supply therapeutic and diagnostic services via the internet uh, on a commercial basis to people within Europe. The MDR also has refined the definition of an accessory to a medical device, which may help to avoid divergence of interpretations seen in the past. The concept of an accessory now includes anything intended to be used together with the device to specifically and directly assist it in its medical functionality. And as was the case under the previous directives, accessories must also be CE marked in their own right. Finally, devices containing human tissues and cell-derived materials are also included in the scope of the regulation, provided that these tissues and materials are rendered non-viable. I'm asked by people in the room here to remind you that any questions should be submitted uh, either by the chat function if it's working on your end or to the email address we showed earlier. That's regulatory at medtecheurope.org. You can send your questions during the presentation or afterwards, and we'll answer them uh, after the presentation is given. To finish up on this slide, two more points. One is common specifications, or CS for short. These specifications are introduced to the medical devices sector for the first time, and they come partially from the in vitro diagnostics sector. These specifications are a little bit similar to harmonized standards, meaning that if you apply them, these specifications give presumption of conformity with aspects of the MDR. However, compliance with these specifications will actually be mandatory, especially for the uh, non-medical or aesthetic devices mentioned earlier. Manufacturers can choose alternative solutions um, from common specifications, but they must duly justify why they do this um, whenever a specification exists for the device in question. And final point on this slide is product claims. Advertising and claims for medical devices are now, for the first time, directly regulated by EU uh, medical devices legislation. And this is on top of existing European advertising rules. Misleading claims made to patients or users with regard to the device's intended purpose, safety, or performance are all prohibited. The MDR therefore expressly prohibits not only off-label promotion of a product, but also more nuanced implications about a device's safety or performance profile. And in particular, creating a false impression about a device's treatment or diagnostic properties or a failure to inform about likely risks associated with the device are expressly prohibited. Turning now to the next slide and some of the key deadlines that are in the regulation. The MDR was published in May 2017 and its date of application is 26th of May 2020. This is the point in time when the majority of new provisions will become mandatory. This gives industry overall a three-year transition period to, to transition to the new rules. However, it is very important to plan around several other important dates, both before May 2020 and beyond. First of all, before May 2020. Ever since 6th of June 2017, low-risk devices that are not subject to notified body review might already, in principle, claim conformity to the new MDR. Higher risk devices, however, cannot be certified to the new regulation until notified bodies exist and become available to the manufacturer. So when can notified bodies become available? Well, from 26th of November 2017, any interested organization can begin applying for designation as a notified body under the new regulation. The application process is presently understood to take up to 18 months or so, meaning that notified bodies should be able to start certifying products by around 2019, or one year before the mandatory application date. This points to potential bottlenecks in the future availability and capacity of notified bodies, as there could be quite a rush 
to recertify products in the final months of the three-year transition period. Devices which comply with the new requirements may be placed on the market before May 2020, but this might not occur at significant levels until notified bodies become available and have ramped up the necessary capacity to review product files in great numbers. Manufacturers are therefore strongly advised to work with their notified bodies as early as possible to understand when they can submit their products and in which numbers. Notified body certificates issued before May 2020 and under the previous directive will remain valid until the end of the period stated on the certificate, up to a latest of May 2024. 27th of May 2024 is the last possible date that devices certified to the previous directives may be placed on the market. So, if manufacturers are only able to certify some of their devices under the new MDR by May 2020, the other devices in their portfolio might get up to four additional years to transfer to the new rules. However, it is important to bear in mind that restrictions will apply to these devices. For instance, they will not be able to undergo any significant design changes after May 2020. And companies must plan around this. In any case, 27th of May 2025 is the final date on which any medical device certified under the previous directives may be supplied within the European economic area or made available to the final user. There is no obligation to recall devices which have already been supplied before this date, but after 27th of May 2025, effectively all devices made available in Europe must be EU MDR compliant. In addition, there are other dates to keep in mind, especially in relation to the new Udamed database. The European Commission must draw up the functional specifications and the implementation plan for Udamed by 26 of May 2018. Udamed is central to the MDR's transparency and surveillance objectives. It will contain important information on medical devices, but also other things like unique device identification, economic operators, notified bodies, and the certificates notified bodies issue, as well as information on clinical investigations conducted in Europe, as well as vigilance and post-market surveillance activities. Detailed arrangements for Udamed are still to be elaborated through various pieces of forthcoming secondary legislation. Nevertheless, once Udamed is ready, Udamed will need to regularly use several modules of the database in order to remain MDR compliant. And companies must therefore be prepared to start using Udamed once it becomes available. So when will Udamed become available? Well, it's not guaranteed or set in stone. By 25th of March 2020, the Commission must endeavor to publish a notice confirming Udamed's full functionality, but this is not a hard and guaranteed obligation. Um, after 26th of May 2020, the majority of Udamed's registration obligations for manufacturers should start to apply, but this assumes that the functionality notice is indeed published on schedule. If Udamed, for whatever reason, is not fully functional by 26th of May 2020, some MDR obligations will only come into force later on, specifically six months after the full functionality notice is eventually published. This means that some MDR obligations could be postponed uh, depending on when Udamed becomes available. In any event, whenever Udamed becomes available, obligations to register information on devices and certificates will not apply until either 18 months after the date of application, 26th of May 2021, or if Udamed is late, um, they must only be done six months after the Commission notice is published. It is therefore essential for industry to monitor the readiness of Udamed and to be prepared to start complying with their different registration obligations according to a complex range of possible deadlines, many of which might not be known until later on in the process. There are a couple of other important dates to keep in mind too. Uh, 
mandatory UDI or unique device identification labeling is something that will be phased in gradually between May 2021 and May 2027, dependent on the risk class your product is in. The very highest risk devices will become subject to this obligation first, and lower risk devices will then need UDI labeling thereafter and in several waves that will follow. Companies should note that the obligation to put UDI on device labels is separate from the obligation to assign UDI to devices, separate from the obligation to register UDI information in Udemed, uh, and to include UDI information in regulatory documentation. In other words, UDI obligations are different and will apply at different dates, and therefore must be planned for independently. Final point on this slide, the EUMDR introduces a centralized coordinated assessment procedure for multi-country clinical investigations conducted in Europe. This procedure for multi-country clinical investigations becomes mandatory after May 2027 and will hopefully bring increased efficiencies to the clinical development process. Um, prior to that, from May 2020 to May 2027, this procedure will only apply where member states have agreed to apply it, meaning in practice it could still be necessary to apply for some multi-country clinical studies on a country-by-country -country basis, but over time this is expected to be centralized and simplified. Turning now to the next slide, what are some of the key challenges when planning for and implementing the new regulation? Well, the first challenge by far is going to be prioritization. This is expected to be a key challenge for most companies because of the sheer depth and breadth of the new requirements and the complexity of the deadlines mentioned earlier. Increased clinical data requirements in particular will require companies to evaluate as early as possible which legacy products they will prioritize for early transition to the new rules which products they will upgrade later on, and which products they may retire. Another key challenge is notified bodies, made more complex by Brexit. Prioritization, early decision making, and preparation are especially key because of the very short window of time which notified bodies will have to review manufacturers and their product technical files after becoming available. The European Union has already seen a reduction in the overall number of notified bodies for medical devices, and there are concerns that the increased obligations for notified bodies will lead to challenges, like competitive recruitment for expert auditors, the number of which is limited, challenges like failed designations or the need for notified bodies to apply once again. Some voluntary decisions might also be made by notified bodies to exit the medical devices market altogether. Um, and there might be voluntary decisions by notified bodies to remain in business but restrict the scope of their activities. And additionally, since around half of all medical devices and CE marking is done by UK notified bodies, Brexit will require that UK notified bodies apply to different national authorities for redesignation. This may increase the overall risk of delays to the process and also increase the risk of bottlenecking in the system's capacity to pro process recertification of products. Another key challenge, of course, is the increased compliance burden and the pressure it will have on company resources. Senior managers must understand very clearly that product development functions, as well as quality, regulatory affairs, commercial, marketing, and logistics, will all need to be actively engaged in order for companies to comply with the new regime. It is essential that companies recognize this early on so that a suitably integrated approach can be taken to adapt company systems and procedures. This is necessary not least because of the expected significant wave of secondary legislation still to come. It is important that companies also take advantage of any opportunities to contribute to the development of this secondary legislation, for instance, via their European trade associations like MedTech Europe, 
to ensure that these implementing rules support rather than hamper continued innovation. In terms of company personnel, there will also be pressures both during and after the transition period. Both manufacturers and authorized representatives will need at least one designated person responsible for regulatory compliance, and this person must be in place by no later than 26th of May 2020. These individuals will assume broad responsibility for the organization's regulatory compliance, and the role has some similarities with the pharmaceutical requirements for qualified persons. Realistically, these individuals will have to be identified and appointed early on during the transition period. Another key challenge is how to manage the distribution supply chain. As well as obligations on manufacturers, there are now specific obligations for authorized representatives, importers, distribu distributors, and systems and procedure pack sterilizers. The obligations for these entities vary, but include obligations to hold certain documentation demonstrating a product is compliant, obligations to verify that pre-market validation procedures have been performed, to verify that technical documentation and labeling requirements are met, and to verify that products and relevant economic operators are registered in the UDIMED database. The details of importers must also be labeled, either on the product itself, its packaging, or in documentation accompanying the product. So any use of multiple importers for the same device will have obvious labeling implications to be managed. Economic operators will each have their own post-market surveillance, information, and vigilance safety reporting obligations including reporting to competent authorities and notified bodies in cases where the device represents a serious risk. These obligations will all have to be reflected and managed appropriately in distribution chain contracts and processes uh, to ensure coherent responses to safety issues that may arise. Authorized representatives in particular um, should note that they must terminate their authorized representative mandate in cases where the manufacturer is found to be non-compliant with the legislation. And authorized representatives may be very incentivized to do so in view of their own prudential product liability exposure. Authorized representatives must also report this termination of their mandate to the national authority that supervises them, together with reasons for why the mandate was terminated. So foreseeably, manufacturers that use third-party authorized representatives may experience much higher levels of scrutiny from their authorized representatives. An authorized representative's potential product liability exposure will likely lead them to buy more substantial commercial insurance cover than, in, than ever before, the cost of which they might well pass on to their manufacturer customers. And these challenges might be more manageable for companies who have an authorized representative in-house. Um, although the EU MDR harmonizes many aspects of devices legislation, there are a number of non-harmonized areas too to be managed. Um, for instance, there is still some scope for different interpretations of parts of the rules and for national authorities to act independently. For instance, the reprocessing of single-use devices is one very obvious example where um, the activity is partially regulated at EU level, but still substantially regulated at national level. The position of a post-Brexit UK is also not certain, although the UK's continued alignment with the new legislation is one of several foreseeable future scenarios. Unique device identification and labeling up upgrades are in many cases new. Um, although UDI has already become a requirement in some other regions of the world, its mandatory introduction for EU destined products means labeling changes will have to be introduced across all product lines if they are not already done. This obligation will be phased in according to the risk class over several years, mean, meaning that there will be in practice several waves of labeling changes for companies to implement. And as already mentioned, increased clinical data requirements and erosion of the equivalence route to CE marking is a big challenge. Under the MDR, fewer products are likely to gain the CE mark via equivalence or literature review routes, 
Um, and use of this mechanism will be limited to products where a manufacturer can demonstrate sufficient access to the data of the predicate device. And in practice, they can only do this in the future via contract with the predicate manufacturer. This, combined with an explicit requirement for many higher risk products to undergo pre-market clinical investigations, means that there is an overall expectation to generate new pre-market clinical data to support CE marking. So depending on the robustness of individual manufacturers' existing uh, clinical data investments, this could certainly delay CE marking in some cases and add to costs. Upgrades to legacy products. As mentioned at the start, there is no grandfathering in the MDR, meaning that legacy products cannot be placed on the market until after May 2024 at the very latest, unless their technical documentation is upgraded to meet the new requirements. Legacy products placed on the market by this date can continue to be made available for a further year until 27th of May, 2025, but this is the absolute latest. Combine this with the potential shortage of notified bodies and their capacity, it will likely force some manufacturers to prioritize their most valuable and strategically important products. And for some manufacturers, this may result in instances of product discontinuation or reduction of investment in the EEA market. Post-market surveillance and vigilance activities will be directly subject to notified body assessment, and those notified body assessments will themselves be subject to scrutiny by uh, supervising authorities at national level. Under the MDR, manufacturers will have to operate systems for preventive risk management and a post-market surveillance system which is proportionate to the risk class of the product appropriate to the type of device and based on a documented post-market surveillance plan. The post-market surveillance system will have to be suitable to cover the whole product lifetime and will form part of its ongoing clinical evaluation along with post-market clinical follow-up data which manufacturers must also gather and evaluate. And finally, strengthened oversights. The new legislation foresees a greater role for the, both the European Commission uh, and particularly strengthen controls and supervision over notified body activity. For instance, new class three implants and active class two B devices that administer medicines um, will have additional pre-market oversight involving a panel of clinical experts. This expert panel may review the clinical evaluation assessment report made by the notified body and the clinical part of the manufacturer's technical file before CE marking can be concluded. This scrutiny process, as it is called, has the potential to delay CE marking for the products in scope or force a narrowing of these products' indications for use. Turning now to some of the key risks and opportunities in the regulation. We've already talked about uh, increased pre-market and post-market clinical requirements and the overall increased compliance burden um, that this may pose. The impact of this on individual companies will vary. For some, it could result in a need for gr much greater resources and investment than currently exists, but it could also serve to reward those companies who have invested heavily in clinical research and clinical data generation in the past. But it may also mean that small and medium-sized enterprises, especially those outside the European Union, if they struggle to meet these requirements, might find themselves more open to partnering, collaborations, or licensing deals as an alternative to directly marketing products in the EU in the future. And so there may be some overall market shrinkage over time um, in terms of the numbers of companies supplying medical devices to the EU. The effect of common specifications on innovation remains to be seen. These specifications are introduced to the devices sector from the in vitro diagnostics sector. However, whereas IVD common specifications focused on technical requirements, um, common specifications for medical devices will likely include clinical requirements too. And so the extent and impact of these requirements is to be monitored. 
Clinical data transparency is a topic who could, which could raise both risks and opportunities. As in the pharmaceutical sector, the MDR will require that final reports of clinical investigations and summaries of those reports be publicly available via Udemed, unless there is a given need to keep the information confidential, and that need has been justified. If there is a repeat of the pharmaceutical sector's experience, reduction of commercially confidential information will likely need to be limited to information on the device's quality. This would, as a result, potentially put some significant sensitive information and proprietary data at risk of entering the public domain, for instance, regarding the design of a clinical investigation. Needless to say, Careful transitioning planning is critical, as the tight compliance deadlines mean that mistakes or false steps could delay or could lead to a delay of certification and possible supply chain interruptions. While greater scrutiny and oversight for notified bodies is likely to create a more level playing field for companies than in the past, any poorly resourced or ineffective notified bodies are likely to be challenged and potentially de-designated in the future which could in turn make transition planning more challenging than it would otherwise be. And as for the increased product liability exposure, the MDR does require manufacturers to have sufficient financial coverage in respect of their potential liability. This requirement for financial coverage must be considered alongside not just today's um, CE marking obligations, but also alongside new rules uh, in the MDR like the requirement to make information public in Udemed, the obligation to provide authorities with product technical information, or the obligation for authorized representatives to report termination of their mandates with non-compliant manufacturers. These new obligations mean that there is much greater potential for non-compliance to become common knowledge and for liability cases to therefore be more regularly raised by aggrieved third parties. Turning now to our final slide, some key actions for companies to take uh, as they seek to comply with the new rules. It's clear that the MDR imposes significantly increased requirements on manufacturers and on other economic operators in the supply chain, and there are relatively short time frames for achieving compliance. So it's important that companies carefully plan the steps they plan to take to ensure that compliance is achieved by the required deadlines. We categorize these actions by, in terms of processes, products, and people. Firstly, regarding processes. Manufacturers clearly should gap assess their existing processes and their systems against the requirements of the new regulation so that they identify any deltas in their processes and any remedies that are required. They should also be prepared to adapt to the significant amount of secondary legislation expected to come their way in the coming years. This should be carefully monitored up until at least May 2020, if not beyond, and adequate resources should be made available to help the company adapt as this legislation is published. Agility is likely to be important because bringing yourself up to speed on the rules today might still mean that you need to shift gears and adjust to new rules or new detailed rules as secondary legislation comes. And overall, of course, a detailed timeline for compliance should be prepared and necessary changes to this plan should be implemented as soon as possible. Regarding products um, and ensuring that new and legacy products can comply with the regulations is a challenge that will require significant early investment. For instance, the increased requirements for clinical evidence will likely um, mean that companies need to invest more in some cases in order to either launch new products or retain existing ones on the market. Manufacturers will need to ensure that any existing bodies of clinical evidence comply with the new rules, both for the existing products as well as for the new ones. And so for some products, this may not be commercially viable, at least at first, and some smaller companies may struggle to achieve this. For many products, new notified body certificates um, will also be required to demonstrate compliance with the regulation. 
Since notified bodies are expected to face significant capacity issues, at least in the early years, there could be delays in, um, experienced in, in time to market or potential supply interruptions for those companies who fail to get their certificates renewed on time. It is therefore highly advisable to assess the capacity of your notified body as soon as possible and prioritize key products well in advance. And for those products which are of lower priority or where the costs of MDR compliance outweigh the commercial benefits, it will be necessary for manufacturers to consider their options, including pausing manufacture or pausing supply, discontinuing products altogether, or even divesting uh, to another entity. And last but not least, people. Working towards ensuring uh, and ensuring MDR compliance will put increased burden on a company's internal human resources. Multiple business functions will need to actively contribute to the compliance efforts. As said before, these functions include, of course, regulatory and quality, but will also include supply chain, legal, commercial, marketing, and other functions. These functions will need to prepare for the new obligations while continuing to carry out their existing day-to-day -day responsibilities. It is important that senior management recognize this and allocate the appropriate internal resources. Manufacturers and authorized representatives will need to resource early on the required person or persons responsible for regulatory compliance as part of their preparation for transition. In addition, manufacturers must consider the number of full-time employees and whether this should be increased in the run-up to implementation and potentially thereafter to ensure continued compliance. It may be advisable to have a dedicated additional headcount to manage the transition and in particular to monitor the large amount of secondary legislation which is expected to follow. And depending on the size of the company, the use of subcontractors may be appropriate for some of the roles we've discussed. So to wrap it up, thank you for listening. As we've seen, the potential impact on the MDR, of the MDR on this industry could be significant. Each company's individual challenges will vary according to circumstances, but a couple of things should be common to all. Prepare early and in detail. Resist the urge to see the MDR as purely a regulatory problem to be solved by your regulatory staff. And finally, try to stay engaged with the process over the coming years of implementation, as the rules of the game will continue to evolve, sometimes rapidly. Keep your eye on the ball, remain engaged with your trade association, MedTech Europe, and stay atop of the challenges ahead. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, we hope you found it informative. We're going to take some questions now. And as said earlier on, you can send these questions in if you haven't already done so to our email address, which is regulatory at MedTech Europe. So we're going to pause for a minute here and then we'll start the Q&A. So the, the team here in the room has just categorized a little bit um, the questions that have been coming in. We'll try and deal with them uh, theme by theme. Um, first of all, we have questions related to the transitional period, which indeed can be quite, um, quite complex. So the question here is saying that the transitional provisions and the derogations that they include are quite complex and will require some further guidance or clarification in order to um, ensure a proper and smooth implementation of the regulation. And so the question is, do the regulators seem sufficiently aware of this complexity uh, inside the EU and outside the EU about the changes that the MDR will bring? And is the transition period uh, clearly understood? Well, that's a fantastic question because as you've seen, the transitional uh, the transition period itself is very complex. And if you read the regulation, um, the articles on this, there's only a couple of them, but they're very, very long, and there are a number of dates to keep in mind. The short answer is I agree that guidance is needed, 
Uh, we've tried to map out some of the key dates in this webinar, but um, we're, we're very much looking forward to having uh, official guidance from the authorities on this. There are a number of things to keep in mind here. First of all, the European Commission has its own communication strategy for the regulation and will be publishing uh, details on the transition period in the coming months. I think this will be certainly valuable both inside Europe and outside of Europe because there have already been one or two cases where the transition period has been um, misunderstood or not sufficiently understood. For instance, we had the experience in the last few months, one of the uh, regulators outside of Europe um, published a consultation that referred to the new European regulation. And while it seemed to recognize most aspects of the transitional period, it didn't seem to fully understand that products, um, existing products with a certificate under the directive can be uh, certified one more time and, as we've said, could have their certificate remain valid up until May 2024. So in other words, yes, it is true that there is a three-year transition period, but for certain products, they will actually be able to remain compliant with the directives uh, for seven years rather than three. So this is an example of a detail which perhaps hasn't been um, uh, fully communicated yet, and we're looking forward to the Commission's uh, communication strategy on that. Uh, another one is recognition of this inside Europe, not just by authorities outside Europe. Um, we have heard one or two cases of um, tendering authorities in one member state wanting products to be compliant with the new regulation already, um, and that the product in question would only be eligible for the tender if it was compliant with the MDR. This is, as we've seen, clearly not possible in all cases, because in order to be compliant with the MDR, in many cases, you will, need, um, you will need a notified body. And if you don't have a notified body, because a notified body doesn't exist yet, you cannot yet comply. So there's a need, I think, indeed, to explain the transition period both inside Europe and outside Europe. Uh, I, I consider the European Commission in the driving seat with this, and we are working with them uh, to flag some of the points that are not easily understood. I've got a question here now about something completely different, which is about um, common specifications. Uh, it says, for newly regulated medical devices like those of human tissue origin, will there be an opportunity to influence the clinical requirements uh, or creation of common specifications uh, through MedTech Europe? Yeah, another very good question. So as we said, clinical, uh, uh, common clinical specifications for medical devices is an example of something that's new in the regulation, um, similar in some respects to harmonized standards. Um, technically, they're voluntary, but they're a little bit more uh, mandatory than standards are because you're, you're, you're basically expected to comply with them unless you can duly justify why you've chosen another solution. So if you like, there is increased pressure when a common specification exists to apply it or have very good reasons for why you haven't done so. Um, so it's a very good question. How will companies know what these common specifications say? Can they be influenced or shaped in some manner? Well, common specifications, unlike standards, are developed more at the initiation of authorities. Uh, so it's authorities who define the scope of these things and uh, ultimately sign off on what the final specifications say. Nevertheless, if we look at the experience of the in vitro diagnostics sector, there, there is some potentially good news. We're told that the common technical specifications that have existed for some 15 years for IBDs have been written with very significant involvement of industry. We've been actively consulted in writing up those specifications. We've found the, the, the experience useful. We believe authorities have found the experience useful. And although it has resulted at times with some unique requirements in Europe, the common specifications for IVDs have been overall uh, more or less compatible with the requirements that exist at international level. So I agree, common specifications are definitely something to be monitored because they are something you will de facto ex be expected to follow. Um, but yes, if you look at the experience we have so far on the IVD side of the business, um, we, we do expect that industry and other stakeholders will be involved in writing them and agreeing them with authorities. 
a question here. Can you comment on the requirement for quality management systems uh, for all manufacturers, including class one manufacturers, um, without an obligation to certify the QMS? At the same time, distributors who translate the IFU, will they need to have a certified QMS? So if I understand the question, we're, uh, we're asked to basically talk about the QMS obligations. It's, it's true that this is one of the key um, obligations you'll find written down for manufacturers in the regulation, one of many. The QMS obligations are quite extensive. They include everything, um, not just from manufacturing quality systems, which is what we conventionally associate with QMS. It also includes the things we talked about, like post-market surveillance and clinical evaluation and risk management. The idea um, behind QMS, of course, is continual improvement, a series of processes which continually improve over time uh, your, your processes and performance. Um, what can I say about that? First of all, you're, you're right to point to class one manufacturers. Um, if you look at today's directives, it's not clearly written that class one manufacturers need a quality management system. You absolutely need a quality management system today if you have a notified body supervision. But um, simple class one devices today don't have notified bodies. So technically speaking, if a class one manufacturer has a quality system today, um, that's not strictly speaking needed by the legislation, and that will change under the MDR. All manufacturers need a quality system, regardless of whether or not they have a notified body. And um, the, the obligations on the QMS, as we've said, are quite extensive. They may very well go beyond uh, the scope of quality system standards like ISO 13485. They need to be looked at um, um, by looking at the obligation in the regulation itself any differences need to be accounted for. With respect, to where, with respect to whether distributors need a quality system, that's a very good question. We've certainly seen one uh, example in recent months. Uh, one member state published guidance on good distribution practices, which was basically suggesting that one of the best ways a distributor can comply with the new MDR is to have a quality system. Now, that may or may not be true. I do not necessarily think the statement is written so clear, clearly in the MDR itself, but it's important indeed to be aware at least one member state sees it that way. But absolutely quality management system obligations will apply to manufacturers. Yeah. Okay, uh, a question here which is extremely um, important and uh, one of the most actively discussed things in Brussels right now and elsewhere. The question is basically, um, what is being done to ensure the availability and capacity of notified bodies? Yeah. So how will the designation process work? When will the notified bodies be available, et cetera? This is probably one of the key questions everyone should be asking themselves right now if they're not already doing so. Because as we've said, there are compliance deadlines. One of the big ones is uh, in May 2020. But, and and we've, we've heard that some obligations, for instance, those related to the Udemed database might be postponed if Udemed is not ready. There are no equivalent measures in the regulation if your notified body is available later. So if your notified body becomes available tomorrow, you might have a great deal amount of time uh, to recertify your products. If a notified body only becomes available a few months before May 2020, you have a lot less time to recertify your products. So right now that means companies are facing um, some uncertainty as to how much time they will really have. Basically no one knows for sure right now uh, how long it will take to recertify, redesignate all the notified bodies which are out there. The total number of notified bodies has gone down, uh, as we've seen. Uh, what we do know is that in, in November of this year will be the time that, notif that organizations can start applying to be a notified body. So you cannot apply to be a notified body now. The applications can only start being submitted in late November. What happens next and when the notified body ultimately becomes available is, is, is not easy to answer. There are a number of steps that need to be followed. They involve not just the notified body itself, but also the European Commission and a handful of other member states who will all together assess the notified body's application, do joint audits of the notified body, 
and, and ultimately the timelines will vary depending on various things, such as, first of all, does the notified body apply from day one or later on? Um, will there be deficiencies in the notified body's application that need to be corrected and, and recertified? Impossible to control. Um, will there be enough experts on the side of the authorities to do the assessments as frequently as we would like? Hard to know. So there's a lot of uncertainty here. It's not coming from any one player in the process. What we do know is that authorities, including the Commission, agree with us that this is a very, very high priority issue. MedTech Europe is very actively engaged with these authorities precisely to understand their plan, the kind of timelines they will aim for, whether they are sufficiently aware of the risks that industry see. Basically, we're asking them to tell us their plan so that companies are reassured um, that the plan is viable and that we can rely on notified bodies being available by a certain point in time. Uh, what we can say for now to make a very, very rough generalization, based on prior experience, it can take anywhere between nine and 18 months for, a full, um, for the full designation to happen. That's nine to 18 months between the application being lodged for someone to become a notified body and for that notified body to become available. But this is just based on prior experience. Uh, what happens in practice will, um, will depend a lot on um, the activities and ambition of the authorities. So um, it's, it's a bit of uncertainty that companies have to deal with right now, but rest assured that it is being treated by everyone involved as a very high priority issue. Okay, any other questions do we have here? We finished off. Okay. I'll take one final question, but I'm told we're coming up to the end of the hour. Don't forget you can continue to um, send us your questions. I mean, we're here to serve members, and um, it looks like we're not going to have time to get through everything, but uh, please keep the conversation going afterwards. I've got a question here about Udemed. Um, will Udemed be ready in time to comply with the MDR, and what will happen if it is not ready? Now, this is a very good question. Now, it's one we touched on in the, the presentation. I mean, as we've said, the, the, the ambition of the European Commission is to have Udemed fully functional and available to industry by the date of application, which is May 2020. However, it, the, reg, the regulation's legal text recognizes this may not be possible. Udemed is a very ambitious system consisting of multiple modules. Um, it's a big thing to be developed, and it has to be validated by a audit that the authorities will, will, will conduct. And so whether Udemed is ready on time basically depends on whether the audit is successfully uh, passed. Um, so what will happen if Udemed is not ready? Well, as we've said, if Udemed is not ready, various obligations will be postponed. These are basically the obligations um, that manufacturers have to use Udemed. So for instance, registering your companies as economic operators and getting a, a registration number for them. You obviously cannot be expected to comply with those obligations if Udemed is not available to you. Same for registration of your devices. Uh, you cannot do that unless Udemed is available to you. So what the regulation says in brief is that these obligations will apply later, um, six months or more after Udemed is ready, but if similar obligations exist already in the directives, those will continue to apply. So uh, the most classic example of this is perhaps um, obligations on um, reporting uh, adverse events, post-market surveillance events, and registering devices. These are things which still happen today at national level, sometimes in national databases or even via paper form. If Udemed is not yet ready to, to make these activities centralized at European level, um, in general, the, the idea is that you continue to carry out those obligations as you do today, i.e. at national level according to whatever requirements the individual companies uh, today require. That may be a bit of a moving target as the, as the years go by. Um, for instance, in the area of adverse event reporting, there are already initiatives to, to upgrade the process, make it a little bit more modern, but you are not expected to use Udemed to do this until Udemed is available to you. So the regulation foresees that the, regulation, the, the database may or may not be available on time. As I said in the presentation, you need to be aware of this, monitor how Udemed 
is uh, evolving and be prepared to plan around a variety of changing uh, uh, compliance deadlines. So this is something, again, um, the company should monitor. We are monitoring uh, the, um, the final shape of the obligations will, will, will become clearer as we get closer to May 2020. So I'm being told here that um, we're a little bit over time already, so we're going to have to close this particular webinar. Thank you very much for the large number of people who, uh, who, who joined. We're going to have a similar webinar in two days on the new IVD regulation, and we're going to have a variety of other trainings uh, on uh, specific topics, some of the topics we've discussed today um, as the coming months and years go by. So thank you very much for listening. Continue to send your questions in. Uh, stay engaged with us, and uh, we all look forward to making the success of these regulations uh, as May 2020 arrives. Thanks a lot.